Good afternoon. I'm Michael Diveney, Executive Head of Thought Leadership at Chartered Accountants Ireland. You're all very welcome to this special webinar to launch a landmark Institute position paper on the reform of Ireland's public sector accounting. Research and written by Professor Kieran Connolly and Dr. Elaine Stewart of Queen's University Belfast. This position paper examines the key changes involved in the Irish government's planned reforms to public sector accounting, which include the preparation of accrual uh, accounting information compliant with international public accounting standards, central government consolidated financial statements, and harmonizing accounting practices across the public sector. Drawing on the views of representatives from government departments, agencies, and advisory organizations and individuals, the full, full report is now available to read or download at charteredaccountants.ie. We are very grateful to our keynote speaker, Michael McGrath TD, Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform for joining us today, and also to our expert panelists, Ronnie Downs, Assistant Secretary of the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform, Joan Curry, FCA, Head of Finance at the Department of Transport and a member of the Institute's Council, Chair of its Public Sector Committee, and also a board member of the International Federation of Accountants. Colin Feely, FCA, a partner at Grant Thornton and Chair of the Standing Advisory Group advising on the Irish government's financial reporting reforms. And my colleague, Crona Clossy, FCA, who is Public Policy Lead with Chartered Accountants Ireland. I'll now hand over uh, to Br Dr. Brian Keegan, who is Director of Advocacy and Voice at Chartered Accountants Ireland, who will be chairing today's webinar. Brian. Thanks very much, Michael, and thanks everybody for joining us and for making the time. I think the seminar is going to be unique in that not only are we discussing the issues, we're discussing them with the people who are going to be responsible for implementing the public sector reform. And that's what distinguishes this afternoon's event from many other similar types of event. Um, we're going to move it along at a reasonably rapid pace. It'll be my pleasure in a few moments to introduce Minister Michael McGrath. Then our authors, Professor Kieran Connolly and Dr. Elaine Stewart from Queen's University Belfast, are going to give us a short presentation outlining the key points of the research that they've conducted over the past several months. We'll then open the discussion to our panellists. Um, Michael has already given you the names, and I'll reintroduce them again very briefly before we kick off. We'll have a panel discussion for about half an hour. We will then invite you, the audience, to raise your questions. We'll deal with as many questions uh, which are relevant and mannerly, and uh, we'll try and wrap up then at half past three. Three. But I'm particularly pleased to introduce the Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform, Mr. Michael McGrath, TD, to address the event. The Minister has been a long supporter of the Institute and indeed the wider profession, and we're very grateful to him for taking the time away from his very busy portfolio to speak to us at this event. The Minister is one of four chartered accountants in Oireachtas Éireann, um, three of whom are government ministers. But it's also appropriate to congratulate sorry, Senator Jerry Horkin. Uh, Michael Fianna Fáil colleague and a chartered accountant on his success in last month's Shannon by election, thus bringing our total in the Oireachtas, by my count at least, up to five. The Minister is a TD for Cork South Central, it's one of the most challenging constituencies in the country, supplying as it does the Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform, the Minister for Foreign Affairs and Defence, and of course on Taoiseach Micheál Martin. Minister McGrath has held a seat for 14 years, including across the 2016 general election when the constituency went from five seats to four, but that didn't stop him topping the poll. It's quite a political story. The Minister's academic career, his training, and indeed his professional career, because he was at one point head of management information systems at UCC, means that he's uniquely qualified to understand both the benefits and the challenges of the reform of accounting in the public sector. It's great to have him here as a senior government minister, as a distinguished fellow of Chartered Accountants Ireland and speaking personally as my own local TD. Over to you, Michael. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Brian, for, uh, for that introduction. Uh, it's really appreciated and good afternoon, everyone. And I'm really delighted to have the opportunity of, uh, of saying a few words here today on this really important topic and to support the launch uh, by uh, Chartered Accountants Ireland of the position paper, the reform of Ireland's public sector accounting, which outlines the benefits and the implications of the government's reforms uh, to public financial reporting uh, and our movement towards the adoption of international public sector uh, accounting standards. So I'd like to thank the Institute and especially uh, you, Brian and Michael Divini for uh, inviting me here today. And I'd particularly like to thank Michael, Executive Head of Thought Leadership uh, here at the Institute uh, for making this event possible today uh, and the excellent work of the authors in the researching and the writing of this uh, position paper. 
uh, Professor uh, Kieran Connolly brings his expertise in public sector accounting and international reporting to the research, while, of course, Dr. Elaine Stewart is also uh, a recognised uh, expert in this field. And they both provided an important piece of research, which will be of great benefit, both as a document of academic merit in its own right, and also one of practical benefit to uh, my own department and colleagues in other departments across government and indeed the wider finance community uh, as we move forward uh, with our financial reforms. Uh, I do want to take the opportunity while speaking today to uh, acknowledge the role that the Institute plays uh, along with many others throughout Ireland's accounting profession in supporting the development and improvement of public policy. And I think the Institute uh, has played such a positive role over the last 15 months uh, in uh, providing guidance, providing you know, uh, thoughtful content uh, and triggering debate. Uh, and Brian, many of your articles and contributions, I think, have been very influential uh, in that regard as well. Uh, as a chartered accountant myself, I'm well aware that Chartered Accountants Ireland, of course, uh, uh, is uh, longest, the longest established accountancy body in Ireland, having been founded as far back as 1888. And with over 29,000 members and 6,500 students, the Institute is certainly uh, a leading voice of the accountancy profession uh, in Ireland. And our members uh, work in senior positions in practice and in industry uh, and across the public sector indeed uh, as well. And on a personal note, as a fellow of the Institute, I've always found it to be a highly progressive body, both uh, in theory and in practice. And it is uh, with great pleasure that I address you today as Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform. Uh, I would also like to thank the officials in my own department, uh, particularly Assistant Secretary Ronnie Downs, who will take part in the panel discussion later on, uh, but also Fergal Costello and Alan Conboy uh, in the Government Accounting and Corporate Bodies Unit uh, for their uh, preparation for this session and for their continuing work in the modernization of financial reporting in Ireland uh, to cohere with international uh, best practice. Uh, and I'd also like to thank all of those who contributed uh, to this research uh, in the form of interviews with Kiran and Elaine. And just to say that your perspectives and insights have greatly enriched uh, the report as a whole, which I think reads really well, I must say. Um, I don't often get a chance to speak to accountants uh, about accountancy itself, but uh, it is a topic that, uh, as we know, is far more fascinating and involving than people uh, often appreciate, or at least uh, us accountants uh, believe so. Uh, the history of accounting and its development and impact uh, is a most interesting subject whether one looks at the Roman Empire and its systems to manage revenue and expenditure, uh, or the Italian city-states in the Renaissance, whose growing prosperity was the catalyst to introduce that essential concept of accountancy, uh, double entry bookkeeping. Uh, in terms of the impact of accountancy, I think of the work of the historian uh, Neil Ferguson, uh, who goes so far as to attribute Britain's triumph over France, no less in the Napoleonic Wars, to that country's successful and credible system of budgetary accounting uh, underpinned by the legitimacy of parliamentary democracy, which allowed Britain to take on national debt and acquire credit on a magnitude uh, beyond that available to France, uh, which was at face value the more populous uh, and indeed wealthy country. Uh, today, 200 years on from that era, the credibility of Ireland's fiscal framework has allowed our country to rise to meet the huge challenges of protecting lives and jobs uh, through a global pandemic. Uh, it is my view that the hard won credibility we enjoy for our macro framework needs to be reflected and developed at the more micro level by introducing modern accounting and financial reporting, stepping up our levels of capability and leveraging the professionalism that is in place across the public service. Of course, financial numeracy and accurate reporting uh, are ever more important when numbers fly around at the push of a button. Uh, accountancy tries to put order in this increasingly complex world of transactions. Uh, if we take a look at the bigger picture, we're in a time in politics and governance where accusations of fake news have diminished public trust in how governments govern and how the modern state relates to the citizen. Transparency should be at the heart of what we do, 
uh, both as politicians and accountants to ensure that trust is rebuilt and to sustain and strengthen that trust over the longer term. Institutions that manage and account for public money need to be as transparent as possible. Uh, it's good for financial reporting and also for the democratic process. Uh, my department is currently undertaking a major reform of the accounting framework uh, for central government departments. And this is something in which I take a particular interest and which I am uh, determined to progress uh, during my tenure uh, in office. Our traditional cash-based system of government accounting uh, is reliable and robust, but very limited in its focus and use. International bodies, including the IMF and the OECD, have strongly recommended that we expand and improve that system, and I very much agree with those findings. Uh, these reforms will greatly assist us in delivering a new and modern system for Ireland, I don't for a moment underestimate the scale of this task. It is quite a challenge to reform accounting rules that have their origin in legislation, uh, still on our statute books, in fact, dating back to uh, 1866. Uh, however, as we would say, as Gwilga is fada on Bohernok will in Casa Own. It's a long road that has no turning. And as we embark on this journey, we can look back on a system that has served us well in the past. Uh, but certainly need modernization now. A phased approach to modernization is well underway, and this will be delivered in tandem with the Financial Management Shared Service uh, from 2021 to 2025, uh, which is another whole of government project being led by the National Shared Services Office, uh, a body under the aegis of my own department. The Controller and Auditor General has reported in recent years that the financial reporting mechanism performed by the state is not as robust as it could be. While we know what is spent and when, cash accounting by which government departments do their budgeting does not allow for the planning and asset management that an accruals-based system uh, allows for. The current system of accounts audited by the CNAG uh, are known as the appropriation accounts. Uh, much of the underpinning legislation, as I've said, dates from the 19th century. Uh, the need to reform is akin to the transition from analog communications to digital, uh, as modern reporting practices are able to better capture the real financial picture of what's going on in an organization. Uh, in short, accruals accounting and the adoption of uh, an IPSAS based standards approach will enable the drilling down for information that not only allows for greater accountability, but for, for far greater efficiency in how the exchequer's money is spent. In Westminster, our counterparts in the UK Treasury have found the short-term benefits of accruals-based accounting to include more accurate valuation of assets and in the long term, a whole of government account report, uh, making for greater ease and transparency. The project also aligns well with the work ongoing at European Union level to consider a European system of public accounting standards and will position Ireland to take part in the initiatives which may emerge from that project. It also will support improvements in the collection of statistical detail uh, by the CSO and facilitate improved returns of Irish financial data uh, to the EU. In terms of major project milestones, a new conceptual framework proposal for central government accounting standards has been delivered, along with a number of exposure drafts for central government accounting standards. Uh, officials in my department are close now to completing a series of information and awareness raising seminars with finance officers to outline these standards and the differences from uh, our current approach. Following on from these seminars, uh, we are shortly due to commence the process of preparation of more detailed accounting policies, uh, which will set out in specific detail the changes that will arise in the move to uh, IPSA standards. It is intended that this will be managed on a collaborative basis my own department will prepare draft policies, which will set out the new requirements and highlight the differences from uh, the current approach for consideration and review uh, by finance officers. On completion of the manual of policies, the government accounting unit uh, in my department will be the central repository for all information on procedures and guidance on IPSAS based accounting for government departments. And I want to note in this context financial assistance that Ireland has received from the European Commission uh, in respect of this exercise, which has supported the retaining of PwC uh, to assist in this process. 
Uh, as I've noted previously, I'm very committed to bringing these reforms forward uh, in a collaborative manner. Uh, I want to note some of the key stakeholders uh, briefly who are engaged in and supporting this process. Uh, firstly, the Finance Officers Network. This is a grouping of finance officers from uh, civil service departments that meet to consider the implications uh, of modernization when it comes to standards and implementation. Uh, these are the women and men who will be applying the IPSAS based standards. They will be the ambassadors for change uh, within their own organizations. Uh, they are also a source of advice and indeed wisdom as to how best to manage this highly complex and technical change process. I'd like to welcome many of you who are attendants uh, and just to say that your work is greatly appreciated and I'd like to acknowledge you here today and thank you for your ongoing work and support. Secondly, I'd like to acknowledge the role of the National Shared Services Office and welcome officials from the NSSO who are here today. The NSSO are undertaking very important work in the development of a new financial management shared services model, which will be crucial in support the introduction of modern accruals based financial reports. Finally, I would like to recognize the input of the Standing Advisory Group on uh, Modernization of Public Reporting and Accounting. While the standards and systems in place for government accounting are grounded in and to some degree constrained by the rules and laws of the past, of course, Ireland's accountancy profession uh, are world leaders in applying modern standards throughout businesses, large and small, in our private sector, as well as in many public service organisations uh, and in academia. And I'm very pleased uh, that distinguished people from our accountancy profession have stepped forward uh, to form the Standing Advisory Group, which provides expert advice and oversight <coughs> to my department on the accounting and financial reporting reforms and advice on the application of financial reporting standards and principles across central government departments uh, and offices. The group will have an important role as the detailed accounting policies are developed, especially in any instance where Ireland might consider uh, uh, adaptations to the international standards, for example, to reflect our own constitutional uh, and particular legal context. I would like to thank all the members of the Standing Advisory Group for their work, and in particular, the Chair, Colin Feely, uh, who is, uh, of course, a partner in Grant Thornton, and whom I know is joining the panel uh, discussion later on. Uh, thank you very much. I also want to note that all of those, uh, all of these groups have successfully migrated online since the start of the COVID emergency and have continued to be an invaluable source of advice uh, and networking, both for my own officials and for members of the groups themselves. The department that I have the privilege of leading, uh, the Department of Public Expenditure and Control and Reform has been acutely aware that further work in relation to skills and capabilities needs to be undertaken in parallel with this reform process. We've already looked at some of the various options that might arise in relation to upskilling. We will be assessing online academic courses on IPSAS uh, accounting at various levels, including certificate and diploma, and partnering with other organizations to offer a range of education training opportunities to underpin the continuing professional development and capacity building throughout our civil and public service. And I'm also aware that there has been a trend in the recruitment of qualified accountants to the civil service in recent years. I understand that over the period May 2019 to October 2020, the public appointment service have managed two service-wide competitions for accountants and two further organization specific competitions. Uh, PAS also reported that 10 government departments expressed interest in drawing from these panels in total, 28 accountants have been assigned uh, through this process. In this context, to further understand the needs uh, of government departments uh, and offices in the context of the ongoing reform and to assist in planning for implementation, a service-wide survey uh, will shortly be undertaken, uh, seeking information on some of the key upskilling and recruitment questions that might arise. So in summary, Brian, today's event is, uh, for various reasons, a really important landmark in Ireland's road to reforming our public accounting systems. Uh, and I will stay for as long as I can uh, to uh, tune in to uh, the remainder of the session. And uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, Joan Curry, of course, Principal Officer in the Department of Transport, who will be joining the panel discussion later on as well. Uh, when I was a mere opposition spokesperson, 
uh, Joan would have brought to my attention all of the various reforms that were underway uh, and uh, uh, gave me an insight into the amount of work uh, that was ongoing at that time and the efforts that the Institute was leading uh, to try and drive reforms across uh, the public service as well. So I want to, to thank Joan and look forward very much to her contribution. So I'll hand the proceedings back to the Chair. Uh, wish you all a very enjoyable and informative afternoon. And thank you so much for your, your time and your, your patience and for listening to me. Thank you. Minister, thank you very much indeed for your kind comments about the Institute, but also too for your, your knowledge and your clear enthusiasm uh, about the process of reform. I think you mentioned very early on in your address the uh, identification of practical benefits and then the kind of the practical steps that need to be taken and you know the work that the finance officers network is doing the national shared services office and indeed the, the standing advisor group they're illustrative of the of the real commitment uh, that you and your colleagues in government are giving to this very very important project so thank you for your support thank you for your interest and your participation today I'm now going to hand over to Professor Kieran Connolly and Dr. Elaine Stewart. Uh, Kieran and Elaine are the joint authors of this serious piece of study, uh, both uh, senior academics at Queen's University Belfast. The minister mentioned uh, the significance of international experience. And now I'm not sure if we're necessarily going to wage a war based on our accounting capacities, but parking that concept aside, any of us who've had an opportunity to study this paper will be very taken uh, by the extent to which Kieran and Elaine have actually researched uh, precedent, researched shared experience in other jurisdictions, and brought that experience to bear in their conclusions and recommendations. And I'm sure they will touch on those aspects as they give us an overview of their research to date. Kieran, Elaine, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm Karen Connolly, and we'll be joined in a second uh, by my colleague Elaine. We'd just like to take maybe 15, 20 minutes to run you through the, the key parts of the report. Uh, fingers crossed, I'll share my screen now, and hopefully everything will go according to plan. Okay, so uh, in terms of our presentation, just very quickly to run you through the, the format of it, uh, I'll start off by giving a bit of background uh, to the reforms. Then Elaine and myself will outline the reforms and Elaine in particular will, will take you into how the position paper was put together, including the interviews. And we'll also, then we'll finish up by outlining some of the key messages from the report and perhaps some further matters uh, for consideration as we move forward. So first of all, just to get us started by way of background, I mean, as has already been mentioned by the Minister, uh, the current system of Irish Central Government financial reporting, uh, budget documents and financial reports, typically they're prepared on a cash accounting basis, and the institutional coverage is largely central government. And while admittedly this approach does provide strong control over, for example, departmental expenditure. There's been a number of reports in recent years that have really advocated reform of these processes of financial reporting. And those reforms have really been advocated on the basis that yes, cash-based information is important, but alone it's insufficient for getting a good understanding of the public sector financial position. And also, Given that at present, the audited appropriation accounts really takes nine months for the, you know, for the period to which they relate for them to be uh, available, Ireland is one of the slowest of the OECD member countries in having those reports publicly available. And also, reports from central government, commercial and non-commercial state bodies, they're not consolidated, and that tends to present a number of difficulties with respects to reports being prepared for the EU, particularly Eurostat. So what I'll do now is I'll, I'll hand over to Elaine uh, to outline uh, just some of the background and the experience of other countries. Thanks, Kieran. So these ideas aren't new, nor are they confined to the recommendations solely for Ireland. 
So as part of the position paper, we wanted to include a section that gave the audience a flavour of what has been introduced in other countries, uh, what have been the experience benefits, and also what have been considered as, as being some of the main challenges uh, being faced. So for many countries, um, the first stage is to typically adopt accrual accounting. So many countries have already done this. Just as an example, countries to adopt full accruals includes the likes of the UK, uh, Switzerland, Australia. Most countries use a modified form, such as the likes of Italy, Spain, South Africa, the Philippines. And some countries have absolutely no intention of um, adopting it at all, like Germany. So, what are the benefits? Well, for many countries, the argument is that cash accounting, whilst it is still important because it's simple, it's cash in, it's cash out, um, many question whether it generates enough information on the present and the future obligations that departments are responsible for. And have these benefits been experienced? Yes, they have. Um, Kieran and myself, for example, we have found empirical evidence to show that in the UK, um, accruals accounting, it gets departments to think about the costs to the future taxpayer when making key decisions around the likes of a policy or around capital investment. And when governments are moving towards accrual accounting, many apply a form of international standards um, as part of their conceptual framework. So the two most common that we have is the likes of IFRS. This originates from the private sector. And then as Minister McGrath has already touched upon, um, you have Ipsos, and this is Ireland's uh, proposed uh, choice. Now the use of Ipsos in public sectors, it is growing. It is used in the likes of European Commission, OECD, World Health Organization, and it's also used in central governments like Chile, Peru, Spain, Switzerland. And many countries like Ipsos because it addresses how to deal with public sector specific items such as taxation revenue, social benefits, um, preparing budgetary information within financial statements, things that you don't necessarily see within the private sector. And its main benefits are that it brings a form of standardization which makes it really easy to compare and contrast financial information, both internally, with, i.e. within um, government departments, amongst departments, and also externally across countries. Now, consolidated accounts or whole of government accounts, um, it's only been adopted by a handful of countries like the UK, Australia and New Zealand. And some of the main experience benefits um, from those countries is that it, it does improve accountability at a parliamentary level. It helps to assist governments in the setting of fiscal policy. And it also is very transparent in that it shows very, very quickly um, some of the overall obligations that you would have at a whole of government level like PFI um, or pension obligations. Some of the biggest challenges then, um, so just in the interest of time, I've just uh, narrowed it down by way of short term and long term challenges. So short term, what resources do you have? What resources do you need to get it implemented? If you don't have those necessary resources, it can go wrong really quickly. It can go over budget and um, it can cause significant delays. And this has happened to many countries um, which have um, ended up scrapping some of the reforms. Long term, um, ultimately the biggest challenge is that mindset change, that cultural change. How can these reforms help me as an accountant, as a politician, as a statistician, as a policy analyst? How can these reforms help me? Why are these reforms being introduced and how will they impact on my day-to-day -day activities? If that buy-in isn't secured at the start and throughout, momentum can be lost very, very quickly. They're very costly to implement, but that needs to be considered alongside the benefits that you can't necessarily measure monetarily, such as better maintenance of assets and better records and also less prep and auditing time. So I'll hand you back over um, to Kieran to talk a little bit more about the reforms. Thank you. OK, uh, thanks, Julian. So the proposed reforms, what are they? So on the 15th of October 2019, prompted by the 2008 financial crisis, and particularly a report published by OECD in 2019, the Irish government announced a series of reforms. So first of all, it's important to emphasize that I mean, in announcing those reforms, it was acknowledged that the core elements of the existing cash-based system should be maintained and are still important. But there are really three broad strands to the reforms. First of all, to introduce accrual accounting in central government departments and offices, and using international public sector accounting standards, or IPSIS, as the underlying framework. 
the second strand of the reforms is to prepare central government consolidated financial statements. And then finally, to try and harmonize accounting practices and standards across the wider public sector in order to enable if you like that wider public sector to be able to prepare whole of government accounts. And at the time it was contended that these reforms, they would underpin confidence in Ireland's public finances and also unlock value from the state's assets. And they would also bring further benefits of, for example, improved financial management, the timelier production of financial reports, and even just a general improvement in economic and fiscal performance. And the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform, as we know, is leading out the reform process, and they have developed an action plan in order to introduce the proposed reforms. So I know diagrams can hide a lot of detail, uh, but just very quickly, that action plan, we can really break it down into sort of four phases or four parts. We're in this part one now, where we're trying to get accrual accounting introduced in central government departments and offices using IPSIS as our framework. Then as, we, then as we move into part two, hopefully 2025, start to think about preparing central government consolidated financial statements. And then towards the end of this decade, starting to roll that out across the wider public sector with the intention being that by the start of 2030, we're able to prepare whole of government accounts. Now, uh, we've been on, I suppose, for whatever, half an hour already, and COVID hasn't been mentioned, but can't really go far without it. Uh, factors such as COVID, pandemic, and complications uh, related to the financial management service system, they've obviously impacted on the timetable. Uh, but however, something that Elaine and I noticed while uh, undertaking the research is that there is strong evidence that progress has accelerated uh, more recently. So I'll pass over to Elaine now to talk a little bit more about the actual position paper uh, and also how we, the, the research approach in the interviews. Thank you, Karen. So yes, as Karen and also Minister McGrath already said, the overall purpose of the position paper um, is to present the purported benefits, the challenges and the implications of Ireland's proposed reforms to accounting. Using a comparative approach, we conducted a total of 21 interviews uh, with 31 representatives in February and March of this year. And we were comparing the views of representatives from, for example, government departments, uh, agencies and advisory organisations. We ask them questions around their current practices, uh, the proposed reforms, the driving forces behind them, uh, the extent to which they're considered appropriate, and also the challenges they expect to face in uh, the coming years. So in terms of driving forces, there was a, a general recognition that Ireland is of a few remaining OECD countries that report still on a cash basis. And so there, there was a view from our interviewees that there has been a push externally from the likes of the OECD. Internally as well, many referred to a growing need for better, more improved information on public sector liabilities. Um, and one of the examples that was being raised uh, was with respect to pensions. The interviewees were, they were forthcoming and they were candid about the challenges that they face ahead. Um, specific examples include um, challenges with respect to staffing, um, with training, and also with IT resources and the IT infrastructure. Most interviewees reported that uh, the reforms, they, ha they have been slow to start, but that there is evidence that the pace is growing with the ongoing meetings between PER and the Finance Officer Network. And um, as Minister McGrath has already um, stated, their meetings to date have been focused around reviewing the various IPSIS uh, standards and tailoring that to suit the, the, the Irish context. Um, and, and that's obviously um, going to be uh, communicated uh, much more now. Despite this being viewed in a, in a positive light, it was acknowledged um, <clears throat> that the timetable has slipped and um, that has also been acknowledged here today. And interviewees were keen to highlight the similar pattern with FMSS and they were um, 
quite um, vocal in saying that, you know, the FMSS, you know, it is considered an essential piece. It should be considered an essential piece to ensuring that the accounts are prepared in a consistent way across departments so that it can help to facilitate uh, the needs of preparing accrual based uh, financial statements. Uh, another challenge that was being highlighted uh, was the issue of what appetite there is for legislative ch change. Um, specifically, the concern that was raised was that if legislative changes aren't being considered, um, there is a fear that there could perhaps be um, a, a dual system. Um, and a lot of interviewees also contested the logic of moving with um, moving forward with accrual accounting, but maintaining a cash-based system uh, for budgeting. And specifically, the fear around this was that if the budget remains on cash, um, is there um, a possibility that people will question the overall purpose of these reforms? Uh, a lot of interviewees, they were unaware of the scale of the changes um, and they recommended that more two-way communications need to be arranged to help secure that momentum and that buy-in. And as Minister McGrath has already um, explained to us, that that communication is going to be um, much, more, um, much more evident now in, in the coming months. Despite this, the vast majority of interviewees, they were very forthcoming about the reforms and they view them positively. The consensus is that Ireland's path for reform, it has a very, very real potential to provide better information on the department's obligations. It will hopefully speed up the process of closing the accounts, which will make them much more time relevant. And that using Ipsos will help standardise how departments present their financial information, making them more professional, more aesthetically pleasing, more user friendly. Some consider consolidation as being the ultimate goal, having that ability to determine, OK, well, overall, what is being spent on health? What is being spent on education? How that information can be used and can be harnessed for forward thinking on areas like sustainability, on areas like climate change. Are they considered appropriate? Absolutely. They are a welcome change. And at the same time, interviewees are very aware of the difficulties and the challenges that they face ahead, but it is, it is absolutely appropriate. And I'll now pass you on to Kieran um, to finish up with some messages and uh, areas for consideration. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Elaine. Uh, so what are the key messages, the key takeaway messages from the report? I think the first one is that support from the top is really the key to the success of these reforms. Experience from other countries indicates that political support and leadership at the highest levels is critical if public sector accounting reforms are to succeed. Also, planning and preparation must evolve as the project unfolds. Good project management and governance arrangements are critical for ensuring, for ensuring the timely delivery of the reforms, particularly, as you all know, that the delivery of government services and activities must continue as these reforms are being implemented. So piloting various aspects of the reforms in some departments or agencies, including having dry run or dummy years may be helpful. And also a one size fits all approach may not be appropriate because different departments and agencies will have different budget allocations, different asset bases, and also employee numbers will have to be taken into account together with the training needs uh, in each of the departments and the agencies. Also, the reforms should fit the Irish public sector con context. They can't just be taken off the shelf from another country. And research suggests that success, however that may be defined, of public sector accounting reform is actually influenced by, if you like, how private sector inspiration is or is not applied. For example, the excessive use of private sector consultants can often impact negatively on the receptiveness to change, especially if public sector staff perceive that the change has been imposed or that their knowledge and wisdom is actually not been recognized. Now, while the public sector has undoubtedly become entwined with the private sector through outsourcing and privatization, it does remain distinct in terms of its stakeholders, its objectives, and its outcome measures. Therefore, the reform should be designed to fit the Irish public sector context. And it's also important to remember that it's this or the reforms they're not just an accounting exercise. Yes, 
they do have clear implications for departmental accounting functions, but their success actually depends upon input and support across the whole public sector. As has already been mentioned, the potential beneficiaries, they include ministers, public representatives, departmental managers, statisticians, economists, each of which must play a role in shaping the reforms. Therefore, engaging with all stakeholders throughout the process in order to gain political support and secure buy-in is really important. And one last message before we look at some matters for consideration is around education and training needs. And the Minister has already highlighted how moves are afoot in order to address these, but investment in human capital to train and build knowledge of preparers and users is critical. And this education and training has to take place, if you like, before the implementation phase, for example, among the core project team, during the implementation phase, for example, for key users, and then afterwards, and that might be, for example, from internal champions and experts. And I'm sure that Chartered Accountants Ireland and its members can help provide support in this area. So just some further matters for consideration. Uh, and I appreciate it's a long time to listen, to listen to me in particular, so we're nearly finished. Uh, First of all, things to consider, the financial management shared services system need to make sure that this meets the needs of the reforms. While there's an argument that the FMSS system has been delayed, this arguably presents an opportunity to review its parameters and make sure that it's fit for purpose in terms of the reforms. Will it help support the production of IPSIS-based accounts, for example? Will it help prepare the necessary information meet EU and Eurostat obligations. Another matter for consideration is, at the moment, we are retaining cash-based appropriation accounts with accrual-based notes, but something to consider will be, do we need to move to full accrual accounting? Would that be advantageous, particularly for the Irish context? Will that allow better management of assets and a greater awareness of our obligations? Also, and something that came up quite a lot in the interviews is, at the moment, we're staying with cash-based budgeting. Now, while a few countries have adopted full accrual budgeting, many have not. And as I said, a number of the interviewees questioned the wisdom of this. Now, while accepting that the OECD recommends accrual-based budgeting, feedback, for example, on the Northern Ireland experience suggests that accrual-based budgeting does bring its own problems, but not necessarily insurmountable ones. Also, how might communication be enhanced? So while there's a general awareness of the reforms, the interviews did suggest that the level of detail was limited, but perhaps that's not to be unexpected given everything else that's been going on in the last 15 months. But it is important to widen that circle of communication particularly through PER and the Finance Officer Network. And one last thing to consider is this notion of where does the public sector start and end of a consolidation boundary. So whenever we start to roll out whole of government accounts outside central government, that's when you need to think about where does that boundary end? And different countries have basically rule that boundary at different places, but it's something to be thought about now and to be planned for. So I'll pass over now to Elaine just to finish up. Thanks, Karen. And just very finally, um, Ireland's planned public sector accounting reforms, they are ambitious, but they are appropriate and they are timely. Um, they represent one of the most significant changes ever undertaken to financial reporting in Ireland and Chartered Accountants Ireland considers them a significant statement of intent by the Irish government to modernise its public sector accounting practices. Thank you for listening to us. Lane, Kieran, thank you both very, very much indeed for a tremendous presentation. You managed to condense down all of the key thinking um, in your report uh, very succinctly. Um, I'm not at all surprised to hear 
such a good presentation because I, and I recommend it to anybody who's, who's, who's attending the webinar. This is an unusually clear piece of research. It's an unusually clear piece of communication in itself. Very, very accessible. And I'd strongly um, recommend uh, you taking the time to, to, to read. It's available from our website. And I think a link has already gone round um, on, the, on the chat system. So what I'd like to do now, if you don't mind, is to reintroduce um, our panellists to uh, add to the contributions of uh, Kieran and Elaine. Um, in no particular order, uh, Joan Curry is a council member of Chartered Accounts Ireland. Uh, she's the head of finance in the Department of Transport and uh, clearly has extensive experience in public financial management in the Irish Civil Service, but she's also um, a board member of the International Federation of Accountants. Um, and again, just to put that into context, there's over 180 accounting bodies represented by the International Federation of Accountants, well over 100 countries, only 20 board members. And the fact that we have an Irish public servant on the board of IFAC is a tremendous advantage, not just to this institute, but I think nationally. Um, her uh, civil service colleague Ronnie Downs is an assistant secretary in the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. The minister has already, I suppose, tangentially introduced you to Ronnie. Ronnie is one of the key figures um, as we embark upon this project. Ronnie, you're particularly welcome. Colin Feely, again, has been introduced by the minister. He is uh, the chair of the Standing Advisory Group, Modernization. He's also a partner in Grant Thornton, head of his financial services audit division. Uh, very, very welcome indeed, uh, Colin. And my own uh, friend and colleague, Crona Clossy. She's a chartered accountant. She's our public policy lead and was one, along with Michael Divney, was one of the, the key people within the Institute uh, to make this uh, possible. She's looked at several policy areas in the, in the, the public space, such as uh, Brexit and, uh, and sustainability. You're very welcome. It'll be great to have you. It's an awful pity, actually, we're not all together in one room. But just you know, chatting to some of the participants earlier on, we're a very good looking bunch. Um, there's an awful lot of us involved in endurance sports. Um, uh, we've got a long distance cyclist. We've got at least two marathon runners. But just chatting to Ronnie earlier on, he's kind of pointing out the whole budgetary process um, is a marathon in itself. So he probably, uh, you know, qualifies um, on that basis alone. So, Ronnie, can I start with you? Um, I've been following the, the questions coming through in the, on the Q&A. Thank you for those who are already contributing uh, the question as well in the chat uh, section. But one of the things that everybody has touched on, the Minister touched on, Kieran and Elaine touched on, was the influence of external bodies like um, the IMF and the OECD in sort of prompting these reforms. Would you give us a little bit of you know, colour on that and maybe a little bit of flesh behind the bones of those rather bold statements? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Brian. Brian. Uh, happy, happy to, to do, do so, so. and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's certainly the case that uh, you know we've had a number of reports over the years from, uh, from the IMF, who did a fiscal assessment report, as they called it, in 2013, and previous uh, previous reports, uh, which you know look at uh, these fiscal assessment reports. They kind of have a look at a, a country's budgeting system and its uh, overall financial management, public financial management. Processes and they uh, they you know pointed to a number of reforms needed, uh, including uh, moving transitioning from a cash based to traditional cash based approach uh, to to something more modern, something that reflects uh, more modern uh, financial reporting standards, international standards, uh, and then uh, more recently uh, we uh, commissioned the OECD to take a, a close look at our system and see what exactly would need to be done. So. That uh, OECD report that was published in, uh, in 2019 was really influential in, in setting out a roadmap for us in specifically what, what, uh, what steps need to be taken, what, uh, what milestones need to be reached along the way. And uh, not that we can talk about some of those a little bit later on. But I remember like, when I started, um, when I started back as a civil servant back in the 1990s, uh, I came across, uh, I remember a, a memorandum on the file from the 1980s that was looking at whether we should move to a accrual uh, accounting. And that referenced a document from the 1970s, which in turn was grounded in a document from the 1960s. Uh, and so the story is that this is something that has arisen from time to time uh, within the Irish uh, civil service. And there has always been some you know, good reason as to why we shouldn't move ahead with it. And uh, I think with, with the kind of momentum that's built up, particularly with those more recent international uh, uh, reports, uh, you know, we've, we've really oh, I didn't. We've decided, we've just, we've decided to, uh, uh, to, I guess, grasp the nettle, 
grasp the nettle and, and move ahead with it. So, uh, as as uh, as you'll have heard. Okay, and in the context of that, uh, that, that that advice, were they saying to us, listen, this is really nice to have, you really need it, or were they warning against specific things that were going to go pear-shaped if we didn't do it? You know, was, was there sort of a spectrum of urgency on the advice? Yeah, well, it's more of a question of importance rather than urgency here. I mean, uh, I mean on the one hand, we have a system of, of financial reporting, uh, particularly in the civil service. A lot of public service bodies, as we know, have already moved to uh, the more modern standards, the international standards. But within the civil service, uh, we have uh, procedures dating back to uh, the last century, or indeed the previous century, as to how we go about uh, doing our business. And, you know, at a first approximation, they're actually, you know, not bad. They're tried and trusted for what they do. You know exactly how much money is coming in and how much money is uh, is going out. But you don't necessarily have a very good insight into some of the more medium and longer term costs and risks and contingent issues that are building up uh, outside of your immediate gaze. Uh, I think sometimes of the um, Museum of uh, Natural History, just 100 yards or so down the road from me, uh, which, uh, as any of you know, have been in the past years. It's a quite it's a beautiful, perfectly preserved Victorian uh, museum with you know, stuffed animals and pinned insects and so on. Uh, but it had over over the past century, it wasn't an awful lot of money spent on it. So uh, some visitors coming from the UK, I remember, would point out, this is, this is actually like a museum of a museum. It's completely unchanged. And um, uh, and uh, the museum actually marketed itself in, in that way to, to some degree. Uh, but uh, over to, that lack of investment in the museum kind of came back to haunt us. You might remember it was about a decade or so. The staircase, the grand staircase in there just collapsed, you know, because it hadn't, hadn't been looked after over the years. Now, since then, I think it's the OPW have done a great job of uh, restoring and it's, it's a nice museum again. But we really need to, rather than just say what a wonderfully well preserved uh, Victorian system of cash accounting we have, we do need to start investing in it and uh, make sure it's fit for modern purpose. Sure, I was going to ask the maybe mischievous question as to whether the IMF or the OECD themselves use the accruals accounts basis, you know, and looking after their own financial affairs, but maybe that's a, a discussion for, for another day. But what I don't think is a discussion for another day is the, is the real importance of um, the international experience. Krona, I know you were looking at that particularly closely in the context of the report. Maybe you just maybe pick up on some of the points that I think Elaine made in her presentation. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, you know, and I suppose the first thing to remember when you're looking at other countries is that, you know, the move to accrual accounting and the other reforms, you know, it's not mandatory, um, but many, many countries, particularly over the last uh, 15 years, have chosen to, in to implement these reforms. Um, and I think that trend is going to continue. So, I mean, Elaine already alluded to some of the countries like Switzerland and Sweden, Spain, our nearest neighbours, obviously the UK, they've all adopted some form of accrual based um, accounting. And, and interestingly, Germany and the Netherlands haven't. Um, you know, and I suppose we, you know, as a nation tend to align ourselves quite closely with the UK in terms of policy matters and um, we have the same views and all things. And they implemented the reforms in, in 2002. And again, they didn't happen overnight. It took about 10 years to actually make the transition. Now, I know they've gone a step further and they've got some form of referral based uh, cash career based accounting as well um, but I suppose you know couple all of that with pressure from the IMF you know recommendations from the OECD if we're seeing other countries make that transition that gives an impetus for us to do it as well um, and I guess it's always important to remember in all of this that Ireland as a country has a reputation of being outwardly facing we attract an awful lot of foreign direct investment we want to be first and best in class and I think to help this we do need an accounting system that delivers information in a useful and timely manner. And I think these reforms will help with that. OK, Colin, would you agree with that? I mean, do you think that the, that the proposed reforms um, you know, are as appropriate as Corona is suggesting um, you know, in, the, in, the, in the context of, of, of Irish government management? Yeah, thanks, Brian, and afternoon, everybody. I think in simple terms, I'd, I'd have to agree, yes, they are appropriate. Um, and, uh, you know, you might we'd ask ourselves the question, why? And there's an interesting table in, in the report, which uh, Kieran and Elaine produced, um, which highlights 
the movement of uh, countries and jurisdictions um, from the early noughties, I think 2005, uh, right up to 2018. And if we think about the territories that adopted the accruals-based approach in 2005, it was less than 10. And there were 20 operating in the work in progress mode, i.e. They were, they were seeking to get there. Over the subsequent 13 years, you had 37 uh, countries had uh, fully adopted, and then you had 67 who were in the work in progress mode. So I think there's validation there that the direction of travel is very much moving in one direction. And I think it would be remiss of us not to recognize that as a nation, as a jurisdiction. Sure, and, but, uh, but just, to pick, just to pick you up on that point, I think Lynn, in of course of her presentation, mentioned that Germany, for instance, hmm. uh, you know, one of the economic powerhouses are not going that route. Have you particular insight into why that might be the case? I certainly do not. Okay. Can I throw that one up to the floor? Anybody know why the Germans are not going the accruals route? Right. Maybe somebody in our audience has an That's insight banger. that they might want to put into the um, chat box. Uh, sorry, Kieran. Yes. Yeah, just to mention, it's not necessarily the sole reason, but there's some researches that indicate it is because of the federal nature of Germany. Right. It's proven particularly difficult to have a unified country-wide system. And the federal system tends to be very, very strong in Germany. So that's one of the reasons that's suggested. Okay, that's that's helpful. Thank you. Sorry, um, Colin, I cut you yeah, off in the middle. Yeah, that's, okay. yeah. that's okay. Just um, you know, I mentioned the why there, but I think it's very important that we we cover the caveat. And again, this has been called out by numerous people, both in the interview phase that that they had with 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 Kieran and Elaine. And you know, the approach will only the reforms will only be appropriate if we get to the finish line. Um, and I think it's incumbent upon all of us stakeholders, uh, leaders who are involved in this process to advocate the advantages and the benefits of, of moving in this direction. Um, and that's a process that's required to, you know, move and shift mindset um, and, and, and sell the benefits of, um, you know, the, the reform, the reporting, the consistent reporting um, and how that can help Ireland Inc., you know, wholesale buy-in is required uh, across the wide spectrum. And I think that shouldn't be lost in the overall exercise. Okay. Yeah, and I think, I think that it's, it's certainly clear from the minister's remarks um, that there's, there's, there's wholesale buy-in at the, at the political level. But, but just coming back to, to the point you're making about the actual changeover, Joan, you've been involved uh, for a considerable period of time, you know, in the, in the, in the nuts and bolts of this kind of reporting preparation. Have you, Talk, talk us through some of the steps that you see that need to be taken as we migrate from uh, the cash basis to the accruals basis by reference to your own experience. Thank you, Brian. And I think there's, there's rather a nice symmetry that uh, the minister was mentioning, um, the fact that I met him about two years ago, and it was the week of the publication of the OECD report. Um, and it's, you know, uh, a, a nice turn of the wheel that uh, it is the minister who's launching the, the, the today's piece of research at, at this webinar. And I think that speaks to one of those first specific steps that, that we can see is that um, that engagement, serious engagement at, at a, a very senior level, um, at the ministerial level, that high level of support that is required in order to drive a, a, a transformational change of this, of this nature of the project that we're, we're embarking on. And also, um, I suppose, events like today, broadening the, broadening the discussion um, environment and landscape around this is not solely the purview of the accountants among the system even though it is uh, our, our bread and butter but this is a wide conversation and does need to be um, discussed more broadly i guess specifically um some, some of the specific steps and again they've been referred to during a number of the, the, the presentations and discussions uh, today are around the, um, the establishment of that framework and that, that starting piece. As we know, there are a number of accounting frameworks. The standards, as, as, we've, been, as we've been hearing, are being developed based on the IPSAS's. The, um, there's extensive work progressing very well, even at this stage. And I think as the minister outlined in his, his um, address, the, the exposure drafts are, are well advanced. Uh, five or six presentations have been given to a number of those interested um, interested groups 
and I think upwards of 18 of the standards are currently in that, that early development stage, which is a significant, a significant body of work already achieved. Yes, there's more to do, but it is significantly advanced, um, and that includes the conceptual framework as well. Um, I think at the same time and in parallel, and again, it has been mentioned, we do have the Financial Management Shared Service. That's an ongoing implementation. Um, and both trains are traveling, I suppose, at speed, and they are both traveling to the same point. And I think, uh, you know, both teams will say that in the, in the recent times, there has been serious engagement um, on the gaps, on the alignments, and really pointing out where do we need to be working to optimize what's happening on both systems. So I think, you know, if we are looking for some of the clear markers already, it is that obvious, um, very clear, high level support, the engagement, the type of engagement that we're now involved in, and then also the significant progress already in train on the development of the accounting framework. Okay, and just just again to, to pick up one of your points, there's a fascinating question after coming in. Oh, sorry, they're all fascinating questions. There's a particularly fascinating question after coming in on the Q and A, where somebody is asking, uh, you know, what kind of specific localization might we need for those sorts of standards? And they point to, I think, uh, it was the, the UK who are you know valuing their their military assets in a particular way, to the New Zealanders. Uh, valuing some underwater assets, not in the traditional sense of underwater shares, but underwater assets in a particular way. I mean, there are any nuances. My, my, my questioner asks about uh, you know, how do you value bogs, for example, and do we need a standard for the valuation of the bog of Allen, which I think is a reasonable question. Anybody, any thoughts on that? Well, if, I, if I'm going to sort of venture, venture a view first, um, and certainly the discussion that has happened on the exposure drafts and indeed the conceptual framework uh, as, as has been currently, um, currently developed is looking at how much of it do we actually attempt to maintain standards so that we do retain that consistently, not only um, among our own, own bodies, but as Elaine was speaking to earlier, how we look at it across jurisdictions as well. But certainly there, there are some of those specifics uh, and they will, they, they will, I suppose, they will um, become more apparent as the, 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 the policies themselves develop um, and there will be the, the Irish context uh, considered for those, but to try and determine what those are going to be right now. I think broadly you could probably reflect on military assets, you could broadly reflect, reflect on certain of the land and buildings or the, the, the heritage assets. Um, but they will, they will expose themselves, and indeed anybody who has, uh, I suppose, views and opinions of them, they would be very welcome in those discussion phases as they're progressing. Right, and possibly the Natural History Museum as well. Yes, possibly. Any other right. thoughts on that one? Ryan, I might jump in there oh, uh, if I can. Just, you know, for the benefit of, of the audience, uh, one of the recent sessions that we had as the, the standing committee, uh, we um, got in touch with a, a contact in the UK who was involved in the journey in the UK and also in, in New South Wales in Australia. And um, as part of that discussion, our debate moved into some of those unusual assets and uh, ways and means in which they capture the information uh, associated with same in order to uh, attach a you know a value or a recognition to those assets i think the overriding principle that that we got from those discussions was that uh, we need to be careful not to head down a rabbit burrow and and get buried in the weeds uh, identification is is a priority at the outset and that can always be finessed over time as we become more familiar with you know the the challenges we face and the policies and procedures become more mature Okay, I suppose in the principle we shouldn't let perfection get in the way of the good. Yeah, I, I, can, I, I can see how that will happen. Because there is a lot to be done. I mean, Ronnie, um, I think the minister made reference to a timeline of uh, 2021 to 2025. And it's, it's a common theme coming through in the Q&A. Um, what's your perception of the, of the timeline from start to end of these reforms? What's your, what's your best estimate? Well, I think it's certainly uh, it's certainly an, uh, it's an ambitious timeline that we have set out. Um, I mean, despite the fact that we're talking about you know we're talking about years here rather than uh, rather than months, uh, it's an ambitious enough timeline. But we think it's achievable. I mean, uh, and work is is underway and it's kind of proceeding at pace. I mean, we've really gone from this as a as a concept and as you know something that would be nice to do to something that is being done at the moment and a lot of activity across the system. As uh, as we heard there from uh, from Joan and from Colin, 
as well. I mean, there's uh, already by late last year, uh, with uh, you know, we have some, we brought on board uh, PwC to help with some of the, the analytical work. So there's a a new conceptual framework has been devised that's specific to Ireland's circumstances. Um, now there's uh, our first target, next prop, milestone target is to bring the appropriation accounts, uh, which are the you know the the reporting uh, accounts that uh, public bodies use, government departments use, bring them up to IPSES standards. So that will involve consideration of twelve IPSES based standards uh, and the the development of an appropriate framework of guidance and support for finance functions uh, in preparing the financial reports uh, to those standards. So we aim to have that done by 2023, those first 12 standards. And then the remaining, well, the, the, we've identified a core subset of about 30 uh, of the overall 43 IPSES, stand, IPSES standards uh, that are most directly relevant and, and germane to what we do in Ireland. Uh, we have those in place by 2025. Um, and then it's you know there's various other benefits you can see the even in the the, the, the institute's report that that, uh, that we've heard about from Elaine and Kieran it, it divides us into the the three uh, the three kind of time periods of getting the standards up getting consolidated central government accounts by 2027 and uh, have a completely harmonised approach and the potentially a consolidated whole government approach by 2030. Uh, I suppose what I would say is that we do need to be adaptive and flexible as we go forward. I think one of the things that we haven't really spoken about yet is the degree to which continued progress and continued momentum will be dependent on uh, ongoing professionalization within uh, the civil service. So as we build up, progressively build up our capacity uh, within the civil service, uh, you know, at, at some, at, I, you could say at this stage, this is the first stage of the of the booster rocket and then those other stages are going to be taken up by you know another cadre of uh, of professionals within the civil service and as over time we build up that momentum we build up that familiarity and that expectation uh, that this reform is only going in one direction okay very good and i want to come back to that professional professionalism issue because again it's it's, it's a theme coming through in the questions but to to I suppose stick with the whole area of the timelines for the moment, uh, mm -hmm. a, a, a challenge that Kieran identified towards the end of his presentation was the notion of you know where the consolidation consolidation boundary starts and stops, and it strikes me just listening to the presentations. Maybe Elaine, you got a view on this. It strikes me listening to the presentations that the the knowing where for, to use the crudest possible measure, you know where the public service starts and stops for this purpose is going to be a big determinant of the timeline. Was that a fair observation? Yeah, absolutely, it will be. Um, and that is a decision that needs to be made that suits the Irish context. And um, that's something that's happened in other countries. It was something I had mentioned in the presentation that only a handful of countries have actually gone down the route of whole of government. Um, and even when I say that term, um, the UK is perhaps the most advanced um, because they incorporate literally everything. They incorporate the National Health Service, uh, local governments, whereas you have the likes of uh, Australia, which only consolidate the likes of federal government. So it needs to be something that very much is dependent upon what suits the Irish context, whether they want to include the likes of um, central government, then local, and then various agencies. Um, but that, I think, um, would be a very good conversation to, ha to start having now and um, to start getting um to start getting some of those issues so for example you know um local governments um or various agencies will they have the, the it infrastructure to be able to feed into that information to go in to whole of government accounts if that's the route they want to to go down to so there's lots of things to uh, to to consider um but you know definitely mindful that yeah we're only in 2021 it's going to take a, a few years to get down that line but okay. um, definitely good for thought Thanks. And Colin, is that something that your standing advisory group is looking at? Yeah, Brian, certainly it is something that's on the radar, um, that whole consolidation exercise and what will fall in, what will fall out. Um, and as Elaine has mentioned, it tends to be a long way down the road. Uh, the two immediate things that spring to mind are, and I think I saw a, a question popping up there on the, on, the, on the question box in terms of semi-states, that being one, and the other one being... Um, the local local government or the county councils, their financial reporting structures are somewhat more advanced, um, and therefore uh, their ability to plug and play into the overall conceptual framework should be somewhat easier at the back end of the process. But there's a lot of heavy lifting required in the intervening period. Okay, 
Okay. Something that a number of people have touched on, I think, I think not least not, not, not least the minister, is the the impact of the changeover on how policy is going to be developed going forward. Joan, have you any perspective on that issue? Uh, and you know, I think there's, there, I suppose there's, there, there, there's one or two two ways of, of, of looking at that, and it is about what is the the, the full impact on the citizen, um, and and what is the, the cost now of, of putting that in place. So it is it is uh, facilitating that thinking and facilitate that thinking in the round, so that we are looking at not only. Uh, you know, the, the non-financial impacts of what is going to, to happen in the future, but that also we've got a very clear uh, picture of what the, the totality of the, the financial impacts are also. Um, and, and being able to, to, to bring the two of those together, you know, whether it is the complete picture of capital and current cost, the complete picture of incurred cost on either front. So, so very definitely, I think it has the, 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 the absolute benefit of being able to fulfill that, that picture for future policy thinking. Okay, so better decisions, not just a better awareness of what we have, but better decisions in the future. Future, yeah, right. yes, yeah. Thank you. Now, um, Ronnie raised the, to the topic of the of the professionalism of the process, and Kieran, I know you touched on it in the course of your presentation. Do you want to maybe expand a little bit on what you found in the course of of, of your search from the interviews that you conducted? Uh, do you mean around the, the level of professionalism? That's right. Uh, I think one thing to, to bear in mind at the outset is yes, it's likely to mean more qualified more qualified accountants, but we should not forget about those experienced, if you like, policy people, because they are so important in the process, because they arguably see the whole picture. So it's not just a case of having more qualified accountants. It's actually about, if you like, both sides of the house working together and sharing the knowledge. And that will also include maybe engineers and other valuers, because they will feed into, for example, how do we value our roads or water system or sewage system? So it's actually professionalism across the whole public sector, not just in a pure accounting context. Yeah, I think that I think that's a really important point because again, a lot of the questions are are, are reflecting thinking in that regard. Colin, I know you want to get in there. Yeah, no, just to, to touch on what what Kieran was saying there. One of our sessions that we had at the back end of last year, um, kindly facilitated by the CSO, in terms of how they collate uh, the numbers for, I loosely loosely use the term Ireland Inc. Um, and uh, I have to say it was it was a, an eye opening exercise for me in terms of the complexity involved in gathering the information from different aspects of the you know the, the operating systems of Ireland Inc. And I think there's a huge amount of wisdom in the machinery that we have uh, at the moment. And it will be very very important that that wisdom is not lost or not forgotten about. Yeah, I think I think that's a really important point because you know so, so often I hear about organisations you know looking at financial transformation or IT transformation and sometimes overlooking just how good they are at yeah. doing things already. So, Ronnie, you know if you're if you're trying to to, to to debrief an accounting officer going in front of the of the public accounts committee, you know at some stage in the future, and he's reporting on the basis of the accrued figures. What what kind of change in mindset are they going to have to undertake to, to get those messages across? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I guess uh, there's uh, what you might call the superficial issues, which are less issues, and uh, more deep-seated issues. There is the reality that most of our, our the, the system, whether it's the political the politicians who are the, the users of the appropriation accounts, uh, and the people, whether the finance officer community or generally, who, who prepare these accounts, we're all very familiar with the way it is done and the way it always has been done. Um, so when we do move to something that might look a bit more unfamiliar, uh, there is going to be a learning curve there, and uh, so we'll need to assist and make a, you know the systems available to our parliamentarians to make the best use and draw the correct messages and interpret uh, the data in in the best possible way. But in general terms. I think what will change, or I guess, will be an additional perspective, an additional facility available to the users of the financial reports to see not just what are the year-on-year 
implications in terms of cash in and cash out, but uh, what are departments doing, what are accounting offices doing to identify risk within their organisation to guard against for the future, to quantify it, to mitigate it, uh, to look at longer term issues, uh, both on the, the, the asset side and the, the, as well as the, the liability side, a clearer focus on the, the, the portfolio of, uh, of assets available to a department and whether they're being fully uh, utilised, like whether for example, old guard stations that are disused or in, in disuse around uh, the country, are they on the asset register? Uh, are they being costed and priced? And uh, is there an incentive uh, on the accounting officers and on the system to make use of them? Are premises being you know, consolidated? Is there a certain, in general terms, uh, Brian, what we're looking for is to move to a situation where there's a compliance focus in preparing uh, the, the financial reports and the uh, appropriation accounts to a, a user focus. Are, are we using them to you know, uh, form that lens into uh, issues of effectiveness? Are we delivering for citizens? Efficiency? Are we getting value for money for citizens? Uh, and that's really that kind of inherent uh, professionalism that we're, we're trying to inculcate and to facilitate with these reforms. Very good. So, so will it make, um, and I, I, I almost hesitate to, answer, uh, to ask this question, but I'm going to anyway. Uh, I know, Ronnie, you and, and John have been in front of the Public Accounts Committee at different times. Even Corona and myself have been in front of the Public Accounts Committee at different times, uh, possibly in different contexts. Will it be easier for politicians to scrutinise the work of their public service? Well, I'll go first and say uh, easier is, is, depends on a number of factors, but in principle, it should be a more routinized, standardized approach to get to the bottom of, uh, of what it is that we're, we as civil servants are uh, accomplishing uh, with uh, you know, the public money that we're allocated, how we're managing it, how we're stewarding it. And uh, the fact that we'll be using, uh, moving to international standards, internationally based standards, uh, means that there be, you know, rather than uh, our own kind of domestically um, distilled standards over the years and decades, uh, means that there, there that, that, that more standard lens, uh, those lines of questioning will be uh, relevant from one department to another. And uh, people with uh, accounting skills, accounting professionalization, both within the system and without the system, can look at the financial reports, get a better picture, clearer picture, a more credible, reliable, uh, and uh, interpretable picture of what is actually going on. Very good. I'm going to bring Krona in, then Joan, if that's right. Krona, um, I know you were particularly interested in the international context. Were any learnings there from the international experience of that, that you know, the, the, an improved an accountability and improved, an improved scrutiny um, on the part of the, of the political sphere? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think what Ronnie's saying is, is, is absolutely correct. I mean, our, and I suppose our, our closest neighbours the UK again, they, they've implemented the reforms for the last 10 years and, and, and I suppose, you know, it has enabled better, better scrutiny. Um, it's also, I suppose, and it's hoped for the Ireland will be the same that, you know, you, you look at projects with a forward looking approach, you know, I mean, Elaine touched on the, the pensions, um, the, the pensions project, you know, we need to know how what we need to fund as a state and I think it's really important you know particularly in terms of like things like the climate bill and the climate action plan there there that's another policy area that's increasing in volume there's growing interest in it and we need to ha have information there on what the public sector liabilities will be in this regard so you know at the moment cash based accounting just doesn't capture that and I think the minister earlier in his speech he alluded to that that the current practices aren't as robust as, as they should be um, and that was one thing that came out in the financial crisis back in 2008 it was apparent very quickly that we weren't just able to get a handle on the totality of our financial position so I think going forward it's so important that we, we achieve that and I think these reforms will allow scrutiny and will allow that to happen so um, we look to the future, I guess, with uh, great positivity if Very good. reforms are implemented. Thank you, Corona. Joan, did you, did you want to add to that? I think, you know, it also broadens the conversation that it's not just about uh, accounting, it's about, you know, a wider prospect or perspective of governance and accountability. And it allows that broader um, broader spectrum to be brought into the discussion. So it's not purely about the, about the numbers. 
Sure, I've got, a, I've got a brilliant observation here in the, in the Q&A box. With only five TDs being qualified accountants, will they be in a position to appropriately examine and ask questions on the new financial statements? Now, my answer to that is that the next time a canvasser comes round and knocks your door, ask them if they're a charge to if they are, just vote for them. I think that will solve that problem, but uh, perhaps that's work. That's work for another day. Getting a lot of questions about the financial um, management information system, the financial management shared services system, I suspect, particularly. Um, again, Kieran and Elaine, just to get your views on that, did that figure in the research and what kind of observations were you hearing in relation to the role of the, the FMSS? Uh, well, I'll start and then Elaine can, can help me out. Uh, it, it, uh, the FMSS uh, formed a large part of the interviews. Uh, I think everyone recognised how it was central to these reforms. Uh, I think even basic things like very boring, let's get the chart of accounts right, uh, was on everybody's minds. And also this notion of we need to have a system that will help us prepare the accounts that sometimes a lot of the stuff is done manually outside the system at the moment. And even when we spoke to people outside of departments, say economists and so on, they were also mindful of, well, can we use this system to help us you know, prepare our stats for the EU and Eurostat and so on. So it formed a large part of everybody. It was really top priority in everybody's mind, how they two, the two go hand in hand. Yeah, just a very simple example, you know, one of the um, initiatives of um, per moving forward is to have faster closing and um, Kieran already alluded to that there that, you know, at the minute it takes nine months and um, to get the, the, the closing and hopefully that will become quicker. If there's not, if there is no appropriate IT infrastructure in place that faster closing simply will not be okay. possible, you know, so these were these were that was just one example of, you know, some of the conversations we were having with the interviews. Very good, thank you. And uh, Colin, uh, sorry, Ronnie, please go ahead. All right, just, just a, a quick comment on about the, uh, the FMSS, the Financial Management Shared Service uh, System. Uh, Elaine made the point that uh, in the presentation that uh, you know transitioning to accruals accounting internationally is very costly, and that's that's certainly true. But one of the big costs that other countries have experienced is adapting their uh, their their financial management system, their IT. Uh, architecture and the fact that this is something that we were doing anyway uh, we were uh, it was always on our agenda to uh, upgrade our financial management uh, infrastructure uh, meant that it was, it was another impetus to us to seize this opportunity to move forward with the uh, the financial reporting the financial management reform in parallel so that there's that uh, that dovetailing of the two approaches and as uh, i think one of the recommendations of the, the, the thoughts that uh, uh, we were left with from the presentation is to ensure that the FMSS is fit for purpose. So, so we did conduct a review uh, of the, the degree to which the FMSS trajectory is consistent with what we need to achieve on the uh, on uh, on the accrual side of things. And um, it's uh, please report it's uh, it's positive. But we do work very closely with our colleagues in the uh, NSSO, the National Shared Service Office. And uh, well, yeah, one of that, uh, the FMSS team is, is indeed a member of, of the, uh, the standing advisory group that, uh, that Colin chairs. So uh, we're, we're very alive to the, the need to make sure that there is a joined up approach on these two major initiatives. Very good. Now, it's almost impossible to believe, but there's only a few minutes left in this webinar. Uh, and it is quite extraordinary, you know, the, the, the KPI, to use the accounting term, um, for a webinar is how many participants you have. We started off back at two o'clock with 180, and we now have 186. So that's probably a testimony to the quality of the research. It's certainly a testimony to your cont contribution as panelists, but it is also a, a testimony to the participants in the webinar. I have never chaired a webinar where I've seen so many questions coming in on such a variety of to topics, uh, so many comments in the chat and you know clear interest so thank you all very much indeed for that there's one particular piece that keeps recurring i'm going to ask colin for an observation and i'm going to ask each of you the same question and i don't want the same answer from any of you so, so i'm the lucky one i can get to go answer. first yeah but you you mightn't necessarily get to go last either so <laughs> don't bet this colin, um a, a train coming <laughs> You didn't bribe me enough before this started for that, Helene, for God's sake. Um, a theme that's coming through is the, you know, the partial migration, you know, 
uh, full um, accruals accounting, but maybe not um, budgeting on the accruals basis. Do you want to just sort of tease out some of the th thinking and implications there for us? Because it's certainly uh, yeah. of interest to our, our Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's something that has cropped up. And, and again, in, in our discussions with Karen Sanderson from the, from the UK in the past couple of weeks, um, it was something very, very high on, on our radar for those conversations. I think to be fair, um, there's a huge body of work here and we have to be mindful of not biting off more than we can chew. Um, if we can do a few simple things right um, and bring the mass of, of, of users with us and convince people of the benefits, it will be a lot easier then um, to bring the accruals budgeting in place. One of the practical problems with, with accruals budgeting is the current system works off uh, the book of estimates that's voted on you know, once a year uh, in, in, in government arenas. And if you were to bring it in you know, on top of this, there's a whole education piece for the Oireachtas in terms of what it means, how it applies. You know, you're applying 80% of a budget in this year and 10% next year and 10% the following year. I just think it would add to confusion and we might end up um, distorting the overall objective. That's okay. just my view. And, yep. and, 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 and a valuable view. And thank you very much indeed for that. So my, my one question to all of you, um, what's the biggest disadvantage to the country if we don't go the accruals route? Corona. I'll have to take you off mute if you apologies, don't Apologies, apologies. Um, the biggest disadvantage, I think, is just not having robust financial information. I think we're moving into a time of change. We've seen you know, the devastating impact COVID has had on our finances. We need to plan and look to the future. And I think if we're going to embark on a huge amount of uh, projects, we need to be certain of the future liabilities. I mean, I mean, pensions has been mentioned before. It is a massive ticking time bomb. Our population is aging. Our worker to pensioner ratio is going down and we need to be certain. And accrual accounting will give us the information to know just what that liability is. So um, for me, that's, that's a huge, huge um, advantage of adopting these reforms. So I'll keep it short and sweet. So. Super, thank you. No, Joan, would you agree with that? Anything you'd like to add? Oh, I would, yes. And I guess that's, you know, that's, that's uh, I suppose, one that's very practical for, for, the, for the country and in what it is that we're doing. But as we heard during the presentations, the implementation of accrual accounting on an international stage, not a global stage, is obviously increasing. And there is, a, there is growing tracking of what's happening in that community, um, again, across the, the, the public sector internationally. And there's a growing number of, of jurisdictions that are adopting it. So even just on a, on a very practical um, and, and I suppose internationally obvious basis, there is a, a, a very good reason to be seen to be um, part of that club for all of the right reasons, but to be seen to be part of that club. It's a, it's a credibility it creates. Super. Ronnie, Colin, Elaine, Kieran, anything you'd like to add? Uh, maybe, maybe, sorry, Elaine, did I, did I jump in there, Hedia? Um, <laughs> okay. It's, uh, um, one thing that is kind of just mentioned there earlier on, I, I, somebody referenced the fact about, you know, do we have faith in our politicians to understand, you know, financial reports under the, you know, the IPSA standards? Um, I myself, you know, being an accountant, I like things to be prescriptive and structure and order and all those good things. I must say, I found it very difficult to get my head around the whole uh, vote system that's in play at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and you might say I would say that anyway, um, but I do think it will be easier for you know new TDs, TDs of the future, ministers of the future, to understand the structure around the accruals-based approach. And I think we'll all get benefits out of it. That's, again, that's a personal view. Very good. Thank you. And Lynn, and just time I'm going to leave you with the second last word. Yeah, um, just... In its most simplest form, these reforms will be the start of providing better information. Um, and that better information will lead to better transparency and that will help to facilitate the opportunity to raise more questions, to have more discussions on these kinds of areas. It's a marathon, it's not a sprint. Um, our area focuses a lot on the UK, even now the UK, their reforms have been in almost over 20 years and they are still um, reforming and they are still trying to find um, ways to make better use of that information. Super, thank you. Kieran, you have the last word. Uh, 
Well, well, thank you. Uh, just to add to that, I would encourage everyone not to accept accrual accounting or accrual budgeting as being the answer. Uh, it's the spirit of the age. It's the way forward. By implementing it, we become compatible with everybody else, but it should still not stop us questioning the information that it produces. And that's maybe one of the biggest advantages. We now have more information to question policy and to make policy. Excellent. I think that's a, a very sensible way to conclude what has been a fascinating discussion. Thank you all very much indeed for your involvement. Particular thanks to Elaine and to Kieran for the wonderful work they've done on the report. Thank you all for attending, for listening. I hope I've covered as many of the questions you raised as I possibly could. And I'm now going to hand you back to Michael. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you, Brian, and to everyone who attended our webinar today. We hope you found it informative and thought provoking. Very grateful to Minister Michael McGrath for launching our uh, position paper. And thank you also to our panelists, Ronnie Downs, John, uh, Joan Curry, Colin Feely, Krona Clossy, my collaborator on this project, and to Brian Keegan for his chairing and facilitation today. Thank you also to Chris O'Donoghue, Breed Heffernan and Sasha Brinkley for their support on the event and position uh, paper production. We would also like to thank, thank um, Fergal Costello at the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform for his invaluable help and support with this project and for all those stakeholders who contributed by participating in interviews for the research. Finally, I and everyone involved in this project are immensely grateful to Kieran Connolly and, and Elaine Stewart for their professionalism and expertise in writing this highly accessible and we hope helpful position paper. As I mentioned earlier, it's available to download from the Chartered Accountants Ireland website, and we've included a link to it in the chat for this webinar. If you have any questions and like to receive a copy, please email publishing at chartedaccountants.ie. Thank you. <laughs>